This is Duke University. Thank you all for coming to tonight's uh, reading group session. Uh, we've been doing this all year, actually, under the rubric of Rethinking Global Cities. Each month we take up a different city and we analyze it with the help of an expert. And uh, today we're very fortunate to have Professor Jamal Kapadar from Harvard <coughs> to come talk to us about early modern Istanbul. Um, this is part of a longer visit, so we'll have a reading group session tonight. We have a public talk tomorrow um, on the topic of early modern Istanbul. And then, um, for those diehard fans, on Wednesday night at 5.20 at UNC, we have another talk by Professor Kapadar entitled Kind Gaze versus Tolerance, an alternative approach to neighbors in medieval Anatolia. Were there two articles that... Uh, there were more than two. There, there more were, than there two. Were, there were a number of articles. I see. All of them, they could download. I see. So, so we, had, we had actually a wonderful selection, uh, Sultan's, profession, uh, Sultan's Procession, Janissaries and Other Riff Raff, uh, How Dark is the History of the Night. That's the one uh, a history I of thought coffee. we would focus on. Huh? And then uh, the Dervish Self and Other. Okay. So, oh, okay. Yeah. so I will focus on the coffee house one, which is what I thought uh, was the main reading for today. And that piece was prepared with, a, with some visual materials in mind. And hopefully, it will be published. Certain sections, we can talk about it. And I, of course, would like to hear your opinions on this and that so that uh, I can make use of them as I expand with for rather, a new publication with these kinds of pictures in mind. The piece is definitely written with those visual materials in mind. So there is something missing there that I couldn't help given the nature of the publication. But for the moment, it'll do, I thought, and released it. Uh, why don't I just move to the visuals? This, some of you may remember from an article in Critical Inquiry, a special issue devoted to things. And it had an article on coffee and coffee-related objects in the age of aluminum by somebody who works on Italian modernity to make the point how coffee, for various reasons, not just as a beverage, but also in terms of the very material world which it embeds us in, has become associated with, in certain contexts at least, modernity, a modern way of living, a modern way of thinking, a modern pace, so on and so forth. And aluminum in the 1930s was Mussolini's claim to Italian modernity. And that is the, how the uh, espresso machine got to be the way it was until recently. Now we have a new generation of machines. <laughs> Smart, I'm sure. <laughs> this is one of the earliest, perhaps the earliest picture of a coffee house scene from circa 1600. It's in an album, so you don't exactly get the context. It's not part of a text coherent text, an album in which some texts, but mostly visual materials from different places have been put together. It's now in Chester Beatty in, in Dublin. It gives you an idea of uncertain <coughs> aspects of the coffee houses from the get-go. If you remember, coffee houses as social establishments are launched circa 1550 and then become popular within the next half century. This is circa 1600, and you see folks with roses and carnations in their turbans. You see them with books in their hands. I don't know if you can see them, but you may not have that with a resolution. Uh, but somebody writing. It was a place to engage in all sorts of activities, including reading and writing from the get-go. Some details, I don't know. Some backgammon and chess were part of the scene from early on. 
Can I ask a question about the facial hair? Some do, some don't. But there are more people without facial hair than facial hair. Beards. Beard. Okay. Uh, in this case, it's a sign of adulthood after a certain age. Normally, you should have it. Okay. You'd expect it to have it. So these are mostly what's called shehirolan, shehri, city youths, city lads. Fifteen eighty two was a date of a famous uh, circumcision festivity in honor of the circumcision of a prince, later Sultan Mehmed III, and hundreds of children from the city, boys from the city as part of the general act of charity on behalf of the Sultan. And it was marked by two months of parades of the guilds of Istanbul in the Hippodrome. Right. Many of you know this, I guess. It's one of the most important visual legacies of the 16th century uh, court atelier. This is the florist's procession, for instance, just to give you the context in which I'll show you something else. This is what is now the Turk Islam Eserleri Müzesi, the Museum of Turkish Islamic Art, the former Ibrahim Pasha Palace, with these tribunes built just for the occasion, foreign dignitaries and some others here. Uh, Middle rank the Ottoman dignitaries and higher Ottoman dignitaries here, so on and so forth. The obelisks, you can get the picture, the hippodrome. And this, now picture this as part of another parade by the coffee house owners as a guild. Already they were organized in 1582. And this is life size. Actual apprentices are pushing this. And people are sitting here singing songs and reciting poetry, which tells us something about what songs were sung and what kind of poetry was recited. Karaja Olam was one. Okay. This, I mean, coffee house is also part of the story of entrepreneurial ingenuity, I think, which people generally associate with the early modern era, but hardly ever with the early modern Ottoman Empire. The coffee house to begin with, right? And two Syrian merchants supposedly go to the most populous city in that part, in that half of the world, by then, 1550. Istanbul was not so, maybe until the 1530s, but by 1550, definitely the most populous city, by far more populous than Cairo or Aleppo at that point, Istanbul then. Two Syrian merchants go and open their coffee merchants and open a coffee house. This I would think is a remarkable case of entrepreneurial ingenuity. This is another one. This one is from Cairo. <clears throat> Again, just before 1600, still we're within the first half century of the coffee house as a social establishment. This is the Nile, a coffee house spread on the two sides of the back, on the two banks of the Nile. This is drive through. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we have written evidence for it too. And people would, after they finish their coffee, would send the cup to boats for flirtation. You know, if you, if, you, if you saw somebody that you want to perhaps hang out with, you would send the cup on the surface of the water and you know, the reception would tell you something. That's the idea. The, the description is from Ebriyachi Rebi of what happened. <coughs> On the Nile. But for me, as I said, it's a, it's a very important point concerning uh, uh, the first European coffee house picture depiction. When the early, uh, the early, the first registered coffee house is an establishment in 1648, Oxford, England, which later turned into a coffee society, which later turned into a science society. Sir Isaac Newton was a part of it. But this one is from London, 1660. And again, an all-male clientele. That's an important part of the story of the coffee houses until the 19th century. Ah. This is a book which, which, which had a very uh, popular 
very good reception in different European languages. Originally in French, I believe this I found a better picture from a German translation of the book originally in French. But there are Italian English versions, and it, it went through many editions in all those languages, speaking about the three drinks, three beverages. And this, and I, I never went into the concept. Not for any good reason, it just didn't really enter my radar in a strong way, the concept of cosmopolitanism. I'd rather dealt with vernacularisms, maybe. Thinking of cosmopolitanism as something in the background, never really actively engaged with it, as you must have seen in my pieces. And I know that this conference <laughs> has cosmopolitanism as its, or one of its themes. But if one were to think of the cosmopolis of the social beverages of the early modern era, with various vernacular expressions thereof, this really would give you a very good idea that in the course of the 17th century, people were struck that coffee, tea, and hot chocolate had suddenly become part of the scene so that almost anywhere you go in the world, you would find somebody consuming something like it in an urban environment, I should add. <coughs> the rural environment somewhat later. <coughs> in an urban environment, it reached somebody, some social group, some community, enjoying conviviality around it, or a family environment. So a Turk is depicted with a coffee cup, a Chinaman is depicted, of course, with a teacup, and an Indian is depicted with, with, with the chocolate. That's the idea. And the Indian is standing, the other two are sitting. You could go into all <laughs> kinds of analysis here. <laughs> you know, the Orientals, what do you expect, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, the, there's something interesting about coffee from the very beginning. I'm the first. European to write about coffee and coffee houses is a certain German physician, Rauwolf, his name, 1574. He was in Aleppo and he wrote, wrote about coffee. And after Rauwolf, it's an avalanche. Almost any visitor writes about coffee. At first, as an alien thing, then as something they also imbibe. Anyway, in Rauwolf and others, there is this peculiar thing that they all notice that coffee gives a certain nimbleness of the mind, so to speak, that it really is very good for you if you want to socialize long hours or if you want to read and engage in a kind of intellectual activity for, a long, for, for, for long hours. But at the same time, beginning with Raubles, they also associated with a kind of oriental sloth, slothfulness, which is part of the story of coffee from the uh, beginning. More handsome, lavish coffee houses built. Eventually, this is an 18th century example. This is a very famous one. I, I didn't have time to get into that in the piece, but it's a very important concern of mine. The development of a notion of vistas as part of the culture of coffee houses and more. Say Ritemasha in <coughs> yeah, Topkapı Palace right there. This is from uh, the Topan area. This is to make another point, <laughs> sort of polemical maybe, but I don't mind making it. You know, lately there is the perception somehow that Istanbul's silhouette, the famous silhouette, is primarily geared toward an audience in Para or toward the Europeans, toward the foreign gays. That's not at all the case if one looks at the literature of the 17th and 18th centuries. There is not the same kind of visual evidence, of course, and the two visual cultures are very different from one another. Hence, that silhouette appears mostly, if you just look for visuals, appears mostly in European books, in books produced by Europeans, <coughs> and thus it appears mostly from the para point of view, which is fine. That's partly where it's intended. But otherwise, there are all sorts of literary evidence for that 
silhouette to work from many different perspectives. And there's even some visuals, such as this one. Uh, this, I, <laughs> tomorrow's lecture starts with this one, so there will be some overlap. This is from a more lower middle class, lower class sailors area, Topane, down right by the port coffee house. And poem from Britain, uh, presumably at the site, but it's definitely about this coffee house, talks about Turks, Greeks, Armenians, and Italians hanging out there regularly all the time. It's the port area, perhaps it makes sense. Uh, again, making use of vistas or looking out to the street, the idea of seeing and being seen. Uh, there are also, beginning in the early mid-16th century, the earliest instance I cite in the article 1539, coffee chambers in elegant households. Kahvöldasen, they are called. And this presumably is one. This is a mid estimated to be 18th, mid-17th century. And here, too, is a concern with the the view. There's obviously the contemplative element here, and so forth. Bathhouses were uh, mentioned by Lady Montague as the <coughs> coffee houses of the women. Namely, she did note that coffee houses were all male establishments, but the same type of conviviality and the same enjoyment of coffee to similar ends, conversation, socializing, intellectual activity, music, poetry, what have you, was also popular among women, but in different spaces, households certainly, and also, and also more socially, more broadly in bathhouses. This is from the 18th century. Don't ask me about this. <laughs> I, I, I've asked 10 million art historians. <laughs> It puzzles everyone. Uh, same idea from another <coughs> earlier <coughs> album. The use of other social spaces for daily activity, including socializing, includes obviously the covered bazaars or open-air bazaars, but bazaar areas, uh, fountains one needs to really take into account in terms of the, this is partly a story of the development of social spaces, public spaces around new institutions or new uses found or new, newly frequent uses found of older institutions such as bathhouses. And the fountains are, Likewise, it's certainly not an invention in the early modern era, but from the late 16th century until the late 18th century, and there have been good studies, some of you would probably know those studies, the progression is geometric in all Ottoman cities, not just Istanbul. At some point, I calculated, looking at the map and finding the fountains, you could walk from the northern end of Istanbul, by the, close to the Black Sea, down all the way to Eminönü, and then from Eminönü all the way over to uh, the Yedikule area, city walls, where the city walls end, and you would find a public fountain to have good, fresh water, free of charge, free of plastic, at regular intervals. The fountains are also places where many of the early modern stories begin in if, if they are going to develop into a love story. That's one of the places where the girl and the boy can meet legitimate. Public transportation. Uh, here you have an old woman, and the government occasionally tried to intervene and say, we hear that on boats, there's too much mixing together, and there shouldn't be. But 
from the repeat nature of those edicts, you can tell that, uh, that people were going about and doing things rather differently. In this one, you see a more mixed group of passengers, men and women, and Christians and Muslims. This is a Venetian, or a, an album prepared in Istanbul for a Ven Venetian gentleman in the circa mid 17th century. More famous uh, late 18th century picture of, or mid 18th century picture of the Kaatane Sweetwaters turning into a picnic site, which is studied in detail in Shirin Hamadeh's book on the pleasures of the city. I don't know if that was part of any readings in on cosmopolitanism, but could be. Okay, also is a place to exchange news. It's a later picture from the London Illustrated about news of war. But it gives you a very good sense of the animation with which people are engaged in politics. And from the 18th century onward, some of the late 18th, early 19th century examples have been published by Genghis Khan. From the 18th century, there are even earlier ones I've seen, but only a few. Uh, the government tries to keep some agents in the more popular coffee houses to report on what was being discussed. In terms of the uh, use of in conquest of the night or the new uses of the night time that I also try to deal with in this research, this picture is from 1570, and it's supposed to be, and, and it is, uh, by a German traveler who says this is an invention. It is new. It doesn't exist anywhere yet. That's what Istanbulites told him. And it is true, actually. This is the mahia, the practice starting in the art of decorating illuminating the space between two minarets or the nights of Ramadan and on other uh, festive occasions and then other parts of the city too. That kind of lighting is a new thing in city life. And nighttime entertainments, I compared in much more detail than in that, that article the festivities of 1582 and 1720 for which we have plenty of records, visual and textual. And you can see several things in that comparison of two festivities spread apart from one another by a century and a half. And one thing you can see is that the nighttime is used much more and much more methodically. If you remember in the piece I talk about, for instance, how in 1582 they say, oh, we had fun and joy until the wee hours of the morning. In 1720, they say, Nighttime festivities started at 8 p.m. They went on first with the acrobats for two hours, and then came in such and such for three more hours, and it all ended at 2 a.m. I make up the numbers, but the idea of depicting nighttime activity changes. This is the golden horn. There are all sorts of and why do they use the golden horn instead of the hippodrome, so on and so forth, uh, can also be discussed, but I'm just making a comment on the night time, <laughs> more of that. And this is an Amsterdam coffee house, early 18th century. Several books, botanical slash botanical social Treatises were written on coffee in different European languages from the 1670s onwards. The first one being a translation written by Hazard Ben Hussein for <coughs> Count Marsili, and then Galan wrote another one, and so on and so forth. Partly because, and the botanical dimension of this is interesting, because until 1700, Yemen had a monopoly. Period. There was no other place in the world where coffee was grown commercially, at least. Ethiopia had it also a while. But no other place where coffee was grown 
commercially but Yemen. But when the coffee craze, this is another dimension of the research that I couldn't get in the, in the essay, when the coffee mania spread also in Europe, it led to a very serious uh, <clears throat> trade balance issue. European merchants, mostly Dutch ships, go to Yemen, buy coffee, they have nothing to sell. And leave all sorts, all, leave huge amounts of silver in Yemen, thus in Ottoman lands. They go through the port of Jidde, they pay uh, port taxes, customs revenue, so on and so forth. So after a while, there was among the European literati uh, concern, this is also the age of the so-called scientific revolution, remember, there was a concern to acclimatize coffee and grow it elsewhere. And eventually, circa 1710, 1520, the Dutch in Java and the, and the French in the Antilles managed to grow coffee. And then, of course, the fortunes of Yemen and the uh, Yemeni traders, as Eng Seng would be able to tell you much better, plummeted including of the fortunes of Cairo. Cairo had benefited a good deal from its role as the hinge between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean trade zones. And coffee had come in in the 16th and 17th centuries as a blessing into that scene. And now it was losing that, that very important element. So the botanical treatises had that particular component as Count Marsili engaged with his Ottoman colleagues, of course, as a European cosmopolitan, if you really want to continue thinking about the nature of and the consequences of cosmopolitan encounters. This is very much, much a part of that world. This one, the open air bazaar scene, which also is one which uh, obviously invites some socializing, if I want to. Uh, I just want to find one. Another coffee chamber with a uh, single figure. Ah, yeah. In terms of the social spaces, one should not necessarily think that there's a categorical difference between what one normally thinks of as a secular social space and a religious social space. Mosques or Sufi lodges also had some uh, social concerns, some concerns that, that, that catered to socializing in terms of their arrangement of social space. And also, in turn, they also had some concerns uh, toward the view. And this is the famous Galata Meblevi Hanis, the Meblevi Lodge of Galata, still there, now a museum of Divan poetry, I believe. Right? And you can see that the view was foremost in their minds as one built the uh, stove. That's I can show you more, but that's all I want to do by way of bringing some life to that article that you read. So I think, I think we have uh, time for, obviously, comments and questions. We can refer to not only this particular piece, but some of the other pieces that were, yes, please. That were, that were um, on the website for tonight's reading. So uh, I have plenty of questions I could ask, but maybe usually this takes about a minute of awkward silence before someone decides to, to ask a question. And please approach the mics. Or we can maybe move the mics. I could start with the, I could start with the question. <clears throat> well, we, we read about five of your pieces, including the uh, one on the coffee houses. And the one on the coffee house mentioned the issue of innovations uh, and the puritanism. And that came across right. in a lot of other uh, uh, yes. ones as well. So. Um, one question that came to mind is to what extent is the innovations discourse an urban phenomenon and to what extent is this a, a mode through which Istanbul's urban identity is being crafted 
this, uh, uh, this kind of urban scripturalist critique of various naughty things, uh, new, new behavior, including the stuff going on at the coffee house. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sex, lasciviousness was implied in virtually everyone. I mean, not, not, ev not everyone, but many of these depictions you gave us, you, don't, you didn't engage it directly in your remarks. Um, to what extent in reality uh, is the critique that this is opening up a new forum for lasciviousness actually true? Uh, to what extent are the coffee houses a reflection of broader moral change, ethical change, uh, 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 going beyond the boundaries that were once permitted, that sort of thing? <clears throat> Plenty of good questions. <laughs> try, try and be brief. Otherwise, I could expand, of course, great questions. Uh, innovations. Now innovation has become a buzzword in a very different sort of way through business school <laughs> regurgitations of the ideas. I'm sure you know. One has to get rid of that whole thing. That the new layer is totally irrelevant, I think, to what we are speaking about here. Uh, of the idea of innovation as a... if unaccompanied by an adjective or a qualification, is a bad thing. That is how the word bidat, bid'a, is generally used in the sources of the medieval and early modern era. If unaccompanied, there, there was of course awareness that innovation could be a good thing, but then you would say good innovation, or you would somehow qualify your discourse to imply that it's a good innovation. Otherwise, it's just like the word change. Now we use it as if it's purely a good thing, right? O Obama. <laughs> no, but I'm, when he campaigned, he wanted to make sure that is how people understand. Or, you know, several years ago, you, you started, that was one of my first surprising moments on American TV, uh, McNeil Letter News Hour. That's what it used to be called on PBS. And you had, uh, you know, Catherine D. and Mac this is MacArthur Foundation is one of the sponsors. Catalysts for change. You wait, you wait for something else there, you know. For what kind of change? Come on. <laughs> Catalysts for change. That meant a good thing, period. So it's sort of a reversal of the kind of picture I'm uh, presenting here of a medieval and early modern discourse where innovation meant often uh, a bad thing, and here what was intended was uh, by a group of uh, given different names, ultra-conservative, fundamentalists, so on and so forth, Ottomanists have not found a happy consensus as to what to call the Kadazadeli, but that's a uh, movement of the 17th century that unfolded in three different generations in the 1620s, 40s, 50s, and then again later in the century, and found city life to be full of innovations that were unacceptable. And they included things like coffee and tobacco, or practices around the consumption of coffee and tobacco, but they also included many other types of things that I think, again, had to do with, uh, with the new urban life that had emerged during that period that I tried to describe, describe for my own purposes in the 16th and 17th centuries, such as uh, how to greet one another on the streets. I mean, Katip Celebi is famous for having penned a very important work on these debates of the 17th century on the so-called innovations, their uh, opponents, and their defenders. And he counts 16 items. We know actually there were some others. There are some really wonderful <laughs> omissions by Katip Celebi. But nonetheless, let us just take the 16 that he selected as the main items for debate in 17th century Istanbul society by those who opposed innovation and by those who said, well, this kind of innovation is okay, 
because it's harmless, or this kind of innovation is okay because it's already become custom. Urf is a very important argument against, at least some people used it, Urf, Urf is a very important argument against the uh, attack, assault on innovation, or practices considered to be innovations. Okay. So among them are, among these 16, are things like how to greet one another on the streets. And you know, two of the 16 consist of uh, things having to do with greeting. One has to do with, with Munsafaha, whether you should shake hands, an ancient. Many of these discussions, you could say, but for coffee and tobacco, are revivals of some debate that had taken place in medieval Muslim societies. Some of it comes from their reading of Ibn Taymiyyah. Some of it comes from their reading of Ibn al-Jawzi and various other sources. But uh, two had to do with, as I said, uh, uh, street encounters. This definitely has something to do with the new urban life. Shaking hands versus shaking hands versus bowing and bowing the head were uh, among things debated. Uh, there's one very important element that I'm keeping for uh, Wednesday night because it's sort of the end point of the story that starts for me in medieval Anatolia. But I, I can tell you, it has to do with the fact with 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 with, with self identification. Katip Chelebi writes that. People in his day in Istanbul had taken to uh, describing themselves as being of the people of Abraham when asked, of what people are you? And they defended it saying it's Quranic. It is Quranic indeed. It appears in the Quran as a definition of Muslims, one of the definitions of Muslims. And he says, the Qadazadili and the ulema who think like them, said, no, you should identify yourself as a Turk. <laughs> but see, it is, it is something of that sort. Remember in the early republic, Yakub Kadri Karos Manoli is just bewildered and very angry that he asks, a, not very angry maybe, but disappointed, dejected. He asks a peasant and just cannot get the answer, I'm a Turk, out of him. <laughs> The correct answer is, I'm of the nation of Muhammad, of course. So Millet Ibrahim versus Millet uh, Muhammad was an important debate of the 17th century. Uh, and several other things which indicate uh, uh, an urban society with its own concerns, with its own anxieties, with its own idea as to of, of what to make with innovations, or things considered innovations. Um, Innovation is a very big part of this, and we still uh, could do much more with it, with the notion as it appears in the texts of the time, I mean. Um, the uh, sensuality or lasciviousness that some of these new spaces, coffee houses above all, uh, projected and maybe even encouraged, was one of the issues. But not directly in this kind of debate that I'm talking about, more as a part of uh, questions raised with the muftis, for instance, or raised directly in, in, at the court for the banning of spaces where such activity took place. Let me show you one picture which I skipped. This is a scene, a detail of a larger picture from the Hamsi Atayi. Atayi is a mid 17th century um, scholar, writer, biographer, has a very important collection of scholarly and poetic, bi poetic biographies. Uh, and he also has some five tales, that's why Hamsa, five tales of city life. And it really gets to the bottom. I mean, really, it doesn't, it doesn't hesitate. And one of the stories is about a brothel. And this is a scene in which the neighborhood, led by the imam, descend upon a house, which is said to be a brothel. The scene above, which I do not have, shows you alarmed women looking out windows. 
And here you see the people busting, busting the scene. So then you can look at the uh, government records and, and, and there is indeed some uh, concern by the authorities regularly to intervene, to stop, to change. I don't know if you want to, yeah, I'll tell you how to pan uh, Yeah. Um, actually, speaking of uh, Broncos. Uh, <laughs> 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 Re related, but you, it may not be clear immediately why. Uh, I had a friend who was a business <coughs> consultant in Asia. And after the, around the time of the Asian financial crisis, 1997, he said, you know, all these Americans are now putting money investing in Asia building factories and so on, but you'd be surprised on what basis they make their investments. That is where they put their money. Basically, he said, you'd be surprised, but it's true, they put their money where the prostitutes are. They build their factories where the prostitutes are. <laughs> um, so, so this, I think, relates to uh, Jamal's point that I think in the Anglo-Saxon world, you think it's just business. In the Mediterranean world, it's business and pleasure. Both go together. And why else would you want to make money if not to spend it well? Um, but I wanted to uh, note something on two of your articles, the one on coffee, which you've just talked about, and the other one on room, cultural geography of, of room. Uh, you, you mentioned someone in the room article, um, Ashraf Olu Rumi, whose grandfather's name was or Nisba would be al-Misri, and his father's would be al-Misri al-Rumi, and then his own would be al-Rumi al-Izniki. So you, that does a very nice job of showing the itinerary over generations becoming uh, Rumi. And here you say Rumi in its new meaning was used in large measure to designate a novel social and cultural constellation the identity of those from a variety of backgrounds with a shared disposition toward a certain style of expression in the arts as well as quotidian life. So that, for those of you who may have not read the piece, is uh, Jamal's way of saying this is not about nationalism, this is not about a one-shot Turkic ghazu um, or takeover of Constantinople, but this is something which is constantly being created and recreated. And in coffee houses, you see this, I think the argument is that you see this process at work. So this thing about style is not simply style or cultural material, it's just something fundamental about the nature of these places. But also I think the nature of these cities as places where people from all over meet. So um, you said you were more uh, what was it, uh, localist or um, vernacular than cosmopolitan, but I'd just like to maybe uh, get from you a little more balance on both sides and how you see the both coming together in a place like Istanbul. The word cosmopolitan that's used so sloppily that I tried to avoid for much of the time, though recently I realized that there is more of a specific and more, at least intending to be rigorous, concern by historians, maybe inspired and encouraged by some other developments in some other fields, but the notion of cosmopolitanism is maybe acquiring some new cachet. At least for me, it's becoming, I think, a bit more worthy, if I could say that. Before, what I tried to avoid was something like the sloppy, the unconsidered, the unargued, uh, mantra concerning diversity and toleration, things of that sort. Uh, this is particularly strong, I think, among Ottomanists and Turkish nationalists, but Ottomanists of all sorts. So, you know, somehow we take it for granted that Ottoman 
society or Turkish, you know. Of course, the role of Turk in the Ottoman is another big issue. Let's not get into that. But uh, that is particularly, and particularly noted for its, for its toleration, for its openness to diversity. For that, you probably know what I am speaking about. So, and it's for what it's worth. It's an idea that can be taken and applied. And, and studied in specific historical contexts and comparative frameworks, which would be very nice indeed. But since it's used so sloppily in general, I try to stay away from it. And the use of cosmopolitan for a long while went in that direction of simply hinting at, not necessarily arguing for, not necessarily demonstrating, historicizing, but simply hinting at, at, at a very special quality of uh, openness to diversity and toleration and this and that. Uh, so that's just by way of generally <laughs> um, information regarding my take on the notion of cosmopolitanism. As I said, until relatively recently, you know, reading, for instance, Sheldon Pollack made me think rather differently about the relationship between cosmopolitan and vernacular. Um, I find it right now quite attractive to think about the constructions of both through a dynamic tension with one another and historically, rather than taking the cosmopolis as a given or cosmopolitanness as a given out there of the great tradition of that larger than our place kind of a thing which is there to which uh, which is either historically there or philosophically like toleration mm -hmm. and then you go to it because it is in your nature <laughs> to go to it or not uh, that a historical use of uh, cosmopolitan and vernacular, maybe unfairly, I thought, would be difficult to uh, overcome. I never bothered with it. But, but Sheldon Pollack's been one of the people who convinced me that there is something much more to it that's worth thinking about. And I've been trying to do that, but right, not, 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 nothing in writing yet. Uh, a few things I've asked about, another way the Ottoman studies field approached this is there's not been much of a debate on it, but at least it's been expressed, articulated, that there is a difference between plural and pluralist. First, I think rather seriously by Benjamin Browder in, in the book that is still the seminal book, the book that he edited, Christians and Jews, is that Christians and Jews in the Ottoman Empire. His introduction, I think, is more important than anything else there. Uh, first, by, by criticizing the idea of the millet system, he did something really original and interesting. And he did something else with which I happen to disagree. He talked about these notions of pluralist versus plural, and he suggested that the Ottoman society, no matter how admirable its diversity and tolerance, was plural, not pluralist. Namely, that it had no self-conscious avowal of its own diversity, no self-conscious encouragement of uh, plurality and diversity. That, I think, is wrong. It may not, and in fact, it does not conform to or live up to our contemporary expectations from these notions, perhaps. But there is a very deep, in fact, I would say profound engagement with some uh, here, let me use <laughs> my new vocabulary, cosmopolitan traditions, with some uh, great traditions, with some non-Ottoman, uh, non-Rumi, non-Turkish, non-Muslim traditions. Um, there's a profound engagement with, but in a really different way, I would be happy to agree from our contemporary concerns, profound engagement with its own kind of diversity as it existed. 
and 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 then anxiety as to keeping it within a framework of justice as they understood it, but not equality, of course. And that is clearly there in the Ottoman discourse, that justice is not equality, is not meant to be, and shouldn't be, by the way, for that. Justice is simply a matter of finding the right balances, obviously, adala, and men and women, or Muslim and non-Muslim, are not to be equal in that, but there is to be a balance of some sort that makes that kind of unequal diversity <coughs> coexist, continue to exist, and, and even flourish. And I want to find several examples, but let me just give you one. Of the top 20 characteristics, an, accurate, an Ottoman chronicler sat down and wrote the top 20 traits of the Ottomans that make them better than anyone before or during. <coughs> right? You know, Hasais, he calls them. 20 Hasais. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I once recited it with a drum roll. It makes a much <laughs> makes a much. And number 17. <laughs> and lo and behold, among them is the fact that they possess a capital city uh, which flourishes because it is a noble imperial tradition because it is a harbor to which come people trading from all parts of the world and because its own Muslim, Christian, and Jewish citizens are benefiting and contributing to this brisk trade and human traffic. This is just one example, but here I see something that is rather a self-conscious avowal. Again, the same author would not say that Christians should enjoy the same position in front of the law court. So that's beside the point, in a way. Uh, but otherwise, this is the way uh, he writes about it. So there is a sense of the plurality as something to be cherished, or diversity, and thinking of ways of managing that. Uh, In, in terms of the city of Istanbul, when you look at different accounts of given of things that Ottoman Istanbulites are proud of, say that make their city uh, something to be proud of, into something to be proud of, the narratives are like the story of the first coffee house that I mentioned. To, you know. Syrian merchant from Aleppo and another wag from Damascus came to Istanbul and they started this thing which makes us unique and wonderful, whoever that us is. The Ottoman we, I mean, I've written in Turkish, not in English anything, but in Turkish I, in most interviews, in, 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 in a small book I published, written about the way Ottomanists and Turks say we. <laughs> That's another very important concern of mine. But mind you, uh, it's, I don't want to expand for another few minutes. Let me just say, they hardly ever say we in these kinds of circumstances. It's mostly about uh, some uh, divan lugatu Turk. To, very first uh, Turkish uh, dictionary, Turkish Arabic, mid 11th century, very important uh, book uh, in terms of the history of the language, does not once say we. It's always the Turks say this, the Oghuz say this, the Turks say this, the Oghuz say this. Everything, almost everything written about the one regarded to in after its discovery in the very beginning of the century, in the 20th century, speaks about we, how we say it. So there is something of a similar difference in the Ottoman discourse about, about uh, Ottomanness. Even when it is bragging about it, it's usually in a language of objectifying. The 
Ottoman Turk, etc. So likewise with Istanbul, that was a long digression, but it's a very important one for me. And it says something about the possibilities of <clears throat> enjoying diversity, possibilities of encouraging that. I and mean, the way you say we is a very important part of living in that diverse society and then recognizing its plurality for what it's worth or not, it seems to me. Um, finally, in terms of the establishment of the first two coffee houses, as I said, which is credited to these two Syrians without any qualms. It was established in a neighborhood, just as the way you described it in, your, uh, in the beginning of your comments, namely, the two of them had the smarts to go for a neighborhood where it would flourish, and that neighborhood was the one where people hung out for certain kinds of reasons, tahtakale. You know, after I read with the students in a seminar on Istanbul, Latifi's Evsaf Istanbul, which is one of the first books written on Istanbul, first redaction, 1530s, a later redaction, circa 1580. Terrific book. He talks about different neighborhoods of the city. So this is before they read anything on coffee and coffee houses. Then I turned to class and said, so if you were an investor, if you came to Istanbul, having read Latifi's book, which neighborhood would you establish a coffee shop in? They all chose Tahtakal. <laughs> it was clear. It was very clear. It was a brilliant choice by the guy from Aleppo and the guy from Damascus. Yes, about cosmopolitanism, there's yeah, much more to say, I'm sure. But <clears throat> Just as a, as a quick follow-up to that, if I could. So you, you identify a disciplinary problem, uh, a historical disciplinary problem, right. uh, which you refer to as nationism right. in one of your pieces. But um, some of the examples you give here of urban spaces or city spaces seem to offer a, a way out, especially if we think of these spaces as spaces of... <clears throat> Politics, contestation, cultural production, exchange, and even itinerary, even the story of the Syrian merchants. Um, doesn't that offer some way out of the, the histor historiographic predicament of nationism yes. to go in this direction? That's why I embrace it. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, I mean, I, I, I've been working on coffee partly, but not big part, <laughs> partly for. The reason that I am fed up with this captivity to the larger narrative of the state and the nation in the field, in many fields of history. But it seems like, you know, some street peddler's life in a corner of a small town in the Balkans needs to be told for some reason by. Uh, framing it before and above anything else by framing it within the narrative of Ottoman history, uh, Ottoman institutions, what the state was doing with regard to this or that. Obviously, I like context. And I, whenever appropriate, would like to give the context of larger historical phenomena and, and institutional practices and all of that. But I hope. There's a, I would like to think there's a difference between doing that and then, then the kind of captivity that I'm describing or the oppressive presence of the narrative of the state and the nation. And I find something, at least for my own story, for my own sanity, something emancipatory in studying the story of the coffee house the way I want to study. Or the conquest of the night. I, in a way, I want to say, you know, to me, this is the more important conquest. Or at least it's one conquest that needs to be con con conquest more in the, se in the original Arabic sense, of course, of fatha, fataha, opening, to open something. And this is exactly what it was happening with the nighttime. It was being charted, navigated. And I'm, sometimes, I, 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 lately, 
I, 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 um, I'm critical of the way I've done it in some way that I need to speak about. Namely, because the discovery of the whole business about the new uses of the nighttime and, and, and the kind of imaginative and creative navigation of the nighttime that it entailed is so fascinating to me, uh, has been so fascinating to me. I, even in this article, I think, which is relatively recent, I have given it a kind of uh, progressive spin, a, a, a triumphal story. Here, a, among many other things that early modernity brought that is so good for humanity is the discovery of the night, the conquest of the night, and it's been unfolding like so many other good things. It's uh, improving our lives. That's not what I really mean, though I think I may have given that impression at times. That's not really what I mean. Now I want to take that on much more consciously. <laughs> one piece of, one thing I read has uh, given me I think the kernel of what I want to now develop as a critical way of thinking about the conquest of the night, though there is still in it so much that one needs to uh, find interesting, at least, and worthy and admirable. In any case, one season at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium mm -hmm. spends more energy than the whole annual energy consumption in Liberia. I mean, that really boggles the mind. So what has this conquest of the night done? Really, then one can think of direct, more, more overtly uh, political and contested issues about the night time. And that is in 1870 in the Paris Commune. One of the demands of the communard was that nighttime labor should be banned, obviously. I mean, that piece that you read was commissioned for a book on performers and performances. Hence, I refer to labor only in a footnote. Obviously, one very important dimension of the conquest of the night has to do with labor night, at night, nighttime labor. And since the 19th century, at least legislation concerning nighttime labor, on which there are some very interesting books written, and it's, it's a fascinating story of uh, a good deal of uh, <laughs> exploitation. <laughs> so with all that caveat, back to the story of the conquest of the night, which I thought and I still think is a very important uh, non-state, non-nation narrative that one can bring into Ottoman studies and other fields of history, as I say. And next year, I'm hoping to organize a conference on the history of the night with a few colleagues who barely started to work on this. Uh, and it all, I can see a similar historiographic anxiety among colleagues who've looked at it in Japan or who've looked at it in Europe. Uh, yes. So, so the, the, there were two more hands. I, uh, one, one was, uh, if you want to go first, then Charles, and then Sartre. Yeah, go ahead. Um, since you just mentioned labor, I was thinking about, you know, when you talk about coffee houses and public sphere in social theory, the first thing that would come to mind is like, oh, Habermas and emergence of bourgeois public sphere that's really criticized a lot for um, not taking into account the whole like working class and like their public sphere and the whole interaction in between. And I've seen like different examples that you presented here that would reflect these like class divisions as well as maybe professional barriers within the Ottoman society. So I wonder like how the emergence or transformation of these new spaces um, fit into kind of transformations of conflict perhaps or maybe tension uh, or coexistence between different class structures within the Ottoman society, be it professional uh, in terms of like different professions or um, between the ruler and the ruled in a way. Right, between the ruler and the ruled, it may be a bit easier. And I've given some examples in the piece. 
that the coffee houses, much of the time, not always, I'm sure, constituted means for coming together to protest, to develop the idea for a protest. Many rebellions start in coffee houses or have coffee houses at some point as a critical venue in the process. Of, I've also been doing with a student assistant a uh, cartographic project on the stories of rebellions. The, the 12 major, but let's say the 12, it's a good holy number, the 12 <laughs> rebellions from 1589 to 1826, the ultimate aboli abolition of the Janissary Corps, as to how they unfolded in the street network of Istanbul. And coffee houses always come into the picture rather early on. Um, so they constituted the means for mobilization for these kinds of uh, actions. Uh, if you recall, there is a uh, document that I cite from the 17th century in which the government says, not that the coffee houses are banned, but Jem Iyet is banned. Getting together is banned. And thus, coffee house too ought to be banned. Uh, in certain contexts, that was exactly how the state reasoned. Uh, so between the rulers and the rule, the co by the way, I never used the word public sphere. When I first started my coffee house research, I was thinking more along Habermasian lines, which I abandoned soon thereafter. I just talked about public space. In terms of the relationships, that's a more complex issue among classes, social classes. Uh, the gender dimension I briefly mentioned, which uh, one could add to, but the gist of it was there. Uh, there were, I mean, it, it's a rather versatile instrument to the degree that it's an instrument for socializing or conviviality political action and what many other things. Coffee House is a rather versatile instrument. There were class or profession specific coffee shops. This one is where the ulema hang out. Like today, you know, you can buy pricing things. You can more or less uh, enable and disable. Uh, or by being intimidating more than pricing things. I cite Mustafa Ali again and again as one of the most important dynamics of the coffee houses that he objects to, Mustafa Ali, that he, what he objects to in the story of the coffee house is that the riffraff can go to a coffee shop after having, after having been given their, you know, word on word, their, their worthless salary of a few coins, they can go to a coffee shop and they, they can say, Hey, it's on me. By spending just a coin or two, they can engage in ostentatious hospitality. He says, whereas people like me, we spend gold coins of you know, such scale for a proper banquet. This, to me, is really essential in the story of the coffee house. There is something that I call the democratization of, uh, democratization not in the bigger political sense, to me, in the much more important sense, without the narrative of state and nation, in a much more important sense of really empowering uh, the demos. In that sense, Coffee House was an empowering, enabling uh, kind of an instrument. Also, again, a brief example I gave, which needs to be developed by spending a coin here and a coin there, people, very simple people, could create pop stars. The democratization of patronage, artistic patronage, I think is embodied in the story of Ashik Garib, to which I refer in this piece. Ashik Garib's story is that it's a long and beautiful story and beautifully filmed by Parat Janov. If you haven't seen it, that should do it, Ashik Kerib, he called it, a story he heard in his childhood in Tbilisi, 
Now, in order to be allowed to have the hand of his beloved, he needs to come back with some money. That's the short of it, after several adventures in the beginning of his life. The father of the girl says, who are you? Go get some money. So he has a dream. And in the dream, he drinks the potion of love, which is how the story of any good ashik begins, with a potion of love, right? Badeli ashik. Otherwise, you're just an ashik. You're just a bard. But a real bard, a true bard, has been given the gift by that very special dream. And then <coughs> it just comes out like this. That's how Ashik Garib was. So he goes from coffee house to coffee house to coffee house between Tbilisi and Aleppo. And he makes the money because he's so good. And we know, actually, this is, this, this, this is one of the popular tales of the 18th century, but we know from many other instances of actual lived biographical experiences of poets that that is how many people made their fame. Just is not uh, something. And I'm talking of urban poets, Shehir Ashikari. There, there is no such possibility in the, say, 14th, 15th centuries. It just doesn't exist, period. You crowdsourced <laughs> <laughs> And it is people in the coffee house paying for their coffee and tea that made Ashik Garib into this iconic kind of star figure of his day as a, as a poet. So coffee houses, uh, in terms of the story of uh, social classes, had these functions, among other things. But at the same time, given its versatility, as I said, I'm sure it also encouraged, in certain contexts, exclusionary practices, such as this is the ulema of the shah. But not much conflict. Not much conflict that I know about. Thanks for this fascinating discussion. Thank you. <laughs> I had a, a comment um, about, and a question too, uh, that in Aleppo, and I thought I saw a slide of the Ipshir Mustafa Pasha exactly. complex. That, that was the one, bravo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I wanted to note how how extremely large it is. I mean, in relationship I to the, the comment if I had dwelt on it. Yeah. This is also old stone. Not all coffee houses were stone. Unfortunately, I went over it because I didn't have the uh, accompanying photograph. I see. Okay. Of the actual thing, but this is the building, a really handsome stone building in Aleppo. Now, in some, I don't know now. Sorry. It was in this repair even before this. Uh, and this ground plan, if you can read ground plans, also gives you a very good idea of the uh, very elaborate and really useful social organization. Like a good restaurant, you know, it gives you, this is a whole a public space with a central dome, smallish domes, both a larger space of conviviality, but many small corners where people, small groups, more intimate groups would hang out. For their own, uh, for their own social circle. Yes, sorry. <laughs> and it's such a magnificent structure. Um, and to note that the juxtaposition of it with the very small mosque just to the right. So if you look at the entirety of the complex in uh, Judea, you know the the the, the presidential quarter of Judea, the the fact that you that there's so much of the revenue. Um, that the revenue producing parts of the, of the complex, uh, that, that itself functioned as a, as a kind of, like a public bathhouse, if you will, uh, supporting the use of the mosque, right? Uh, but as, as, a, as a space of social, social, sociability mm -hmm. uh, was so much larger than the mosque, which had, in prior times, had been the primary place of sociability, at least as, as we understood it. So uh, I just found it interesting to see how how diminished the mosque, the square area of the of the mosque is relative to the square area 
of the of the of the cafe cafe hane. You know, the, That's right. so I I just I just found that interesting in terms of entrepreneurial sort of investment and and, and thinking that this is driven by profit. It's driven by um, location, location, location. I mean, you know, think of Starbucks, I suppose, uh, also uh, that placed in an area very commercially uh, um, uh, active in Judea. So I just I wanted to see if you had if you knew of other examples in which uh, the 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 mosque was rel in, in the cases of, of a like an emara or, or an emaret where the mosque was relatively small compared to uh, another place of, of, of social ability you know like a uh, like a cafe hane mm -hmm. or... I cannot think of any right off the bat in fact this one I generally dwell on for that very reason it is. A uh, very impressive example of an investment towards public charity, of course, but it's a very interesting instance of a very impressive investment in a coffee house uh, that could be built in the scale. And with this, unfortunately, the photograph is not here, but the quality of the material, the quality of the stone is of the top level which indicates also something about the sums that were spent in building it. I don't know of any other, but it's worth thinking about. Thank you, that's a good question. Maybe a hammam someplace, something. Right now, as I scan in my mind, all I can think of are the immediate imperial and vizirial complexes where the mosque is obviously going to be dominant. One has to move beyond that and beyond the capital city to reflect on this a bit. Thank you, that's a good question for me to continue. Thank you for the great talk. Um, you tell the story of coffee houses in two stages, if you like, or two contexts, at least that's how I read it. One is the movement we see from south and from to, nor to north, so basically, Yes, it's in the beginnings. It's the coffee from Yemen, Hijaz, and uh, Cairo, Syria, and Istanbul. We have it in the coffee house, the two Ye two Syrians moving uh, northward. And curious that actually from Yemen it doesn't spread right away to in the Indian Ocean, but it goes northward. And um, it's the Portuguese and the Dutch that that, do, that does that. And um, but later on, you and actually there are other things moving up. Uh, from Cairo, especially the uh, the nighttime festivities, yes. different technologies of yes. conquering the night, etc. So there's this curious relationship between Cairo and Istanbul, in which Cairo seems to be the avant-garde. Shadow puppet theater, also from Cairo. I don't have time to dwell on it there, but yes. So it seems. I mean, there's a story of coffee house in Istanbul that is a, sort of that reflects a bigger history of connections, and then. Once it moves, once these two Syrians sort of establish the coffee house, then your narrative also, your context becomes a city unto itself. So now we, we have neighborhoods, we have this, the vibrant social life of a city that kind of converges with the politics of the imperial center. So it's, it becomes a, a cosmopolitan city maybe, but a very claustrophobic place in the sense that we don't, we don't have these wider connections, at least mm. they're not talked about anymore. Mm. They're not made, made uh, part of the story uh, anymore. Maybe, but you're now the, the <laughs> you mentioned the poet, the um, uh, Ashik Garib and his movement. Mm -hmm. That I think is one way in which sort of great. this greater regional mobility is anchored in coffee shops, in, in, in cities, where kind of the imperial politics and social uh, life of a city mm -hmm. sort of goes in tandem with a, a larger story of, 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 of regions uh, connected by trade, by movement of poets, um, commodities, technologies of various technologies of uh, conquering the night in your case. So I thought, I mean, this, this was there, but it wasn't, explicitly conceptualized, and I was wondering what you make of I think that's a, that's a very good observation, and I should do something about it <laughs> next time. <laughs> Definitely. No, it's a very good observation. I, you're right. I get 
and fascinated with what happens in the city, the debates that it, 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 it it's like, uh, yeah, the camera shifts, <laughs> uh, focus. You know, first you have these big pans, and <laughs> and then you just have close-ups. Okay, nice. And, and stylistically, that's um, clearly there. And content-wise, too, it's a concern. Um, what to do? Now, it's just a matter of being attentive to them. Obviously, the mobility, and this is... Also, partly what Eng Seng was asking me, I believe, and I didn't answer that part properly. Uh, yes, there is continued mobility and absorption and engagement with people and things and practices and ideas coming from elsewhere and, of course, obviously also moving. So that, that mobility disappears from the story, which can be, I think, which one can do something about if one is attentive to it. I brought this back on to indicate that this article or anybody writing anything along these lines, coffee and modernity, don't ever, really, maybe in a footnote, don't ever mention Yemen. And I want to bring it on again and again. The story of modernity for me begins in Yemen. <laughs> if you take coffee seriously, you really have to take Yemen seriously. Anyway, for instance, the, um, the, the one the Nile. Yes. Yemen. There's what in it? It's Yemen. This one. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Really. You know, but this is a book of uh, apocalypse. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, it's a medieval text. They're reproducing, but with contemporary pictures. There's also a contemporary picture of Istanbul in it. This is, an, this is a manuscript in the Topkapi Palace Library. Yeah, but with Yemen, Right. Now, what I want to show you is some, yeah, the story of these uh, botanical treatises has a lot to do with continued mobility and contact. Uh, there I briefly mentioned Count Marsili and Hazar Fenusein, which is in the latter part of the 17th century, the transfer of the book of the 1001 Nights has something to do with the same circles. Antoine Galin, who was the first, of course, to produce the Arabian Nights, right? Uh, with a good deal of his own stuff, but nonetheless. Count Marsili of Bologna, uh, Hazar Fenusein, some other students of Katip Celebi, a Dutch uh, diplomat scholar, Levinus Warner, whose collection is one of the best, whose manuscript collection is one of the best Ottoman manuscript collections in Europe, and now in Leiden. There was a very important circle, for instance, of people, which I didn't even mention there, that had a very important part in the larger story of coffee, both in moving the habit into Europe and also in writing about it, in fact, in developing the idea of writing botanical treatises on coffee. Started there, right there, when Marsili asked Hazar Fenusein Efendi to write a book on coffee. Hazar Fenusein wrote it in Ottoman. Marsili translated it into Italian. And then various versions I wrote were published in Europe. So this was one element where I had the opportunity and missed it. <laughs> but yes. Roman, you mentioned that women had a similar coffee um, 
life yes. in the harem, right? Or in the bathhouse, bath right? I showed you this. Is this the only thing we can say about women and coffee? Because here I'm sitting, right. listening to everything, and all I can think of is when I was a teenager, the most revolutionary thing I could have done and did was to bust those all male real coffee houses, not the cool ones. That's all I can think of. Yeah. Now, where are the women? The agency, the, the um, society occurred in the coffee houses of men. And I'm thinking, I bet women are the only ones who did the fortune telling, right? Reading the grounds. Did men have any kind of a tradition like that? Not as far as I know, but I don't know when that tradition started. I still haven't been able to get it to the bottom. It doesn't go away. It would be very good. No, it might. It would be very good to get to the bottom of it. See, this is a... I don't want to pull the conversation to a no. place where... First of all, instead of saying the harem, I would have said the household. It's not always a har household with a harem, Neither right? That, yeah, right. But consumption of coffee in a household is a very big part of it. Only because I deal with social spaces more than anything else do I turn my attention to coffee houses, which happen to be, which are, for their own reasons, primarily male uh, social institutions. Otherwise, if one were to write something or speak about consumption of coffee, one would have to dwell, coffee as such, one would have to dwell much more on the households. What evidence there is, what one can find is another story, but and one aspect of coffee The story of one aspect of the story of coffee is that it, we know, induced. There are all sorts of contemporary witnesses, not just our reflections on it with hindsight, that it induced, it intensified certain kinds of social intellectual activity more than ever before, not, such as the recitation of poetry, music, uh, conversations around such themes, and uh, I'm sure in that bathhouse scene that I showed you, music was sung, poetry was recited, news was exchanged. It's much harder to find more, but I, I, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just, you know, I'm just hoping that others, or I, with the right opportunity, will turn my attention. This semester, I'm teaching a seminar on uh, mostly anonymous genres. And we started reading I don't know if you know the piece called Anon by Virginia Woolf. A-N-O-N -N is the oh, title yeah, of the, yeah. which she never published. She has a couple of redactions of it, which is that she never finished and published it, but later on, of course, it was picked up, and there's a good deal of literature on it. And it's, it's, I, it's really, when I first read it, when I was write, publishing the Asiya Hatun, the dream diary of a Sufi lady from Skopje, which I couldn't give you because, uh, because it's only in Turkish. But Asiya Hatun is a, is a Sufi from Skopje who, who kept a diary of her dreams, circa 1640. And I edited the text and I published it with, a, with, a, with, a, with an analysis, not psychoanalysis. I, you know, I'm not trained in it. I, I, anyway, yes. I, I, but when I say analysis, sometimes in this context, it could be misunderstood. So. Uh, I was saying. You seem to be saying there is a corollary somewhat. Oh yes, Asiya Hat. I I read it first when I was studying that article, and it really blew my mind that essay by Virginia Woolf. It's just historians find it very difficult to get into the to to historicize and understand and 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 make use of the kinds of sources and materials that we can even date. Dating is not the same thing as historicizing, right? So there are proverb collections, lullaby collections, not collections, but lullabies. Who is composing and who is singing those?
but it's Anon, right? That category of Anon is like a very deep frontier, and much of the culture around coffee houses in households is part of that anonymous realm of production of things. Many of the songs, Gufte, you know, you have lots of uh, lyrics compilations in the palace library and in some other manuscript libraries. Gufte Mejmuası, they are called. Some are by very famous poets, well known. You can, by the pen name, you can tell. But there are many anonymous ones among them, and they give me the impression that a good deal of it is uh, women's composition, at least the versification. I don't know the musical part. That too, probably. How to go there? I don't know that. But it is not unrelated to the question about coffee and coffee house and its consumption and the enjoyment of coffee and the world of conviviality cre created around it. You're quite right, and I, I just hope that you know As others will do it, or I'll be able to develop some insights and after more discussions and readings along these lines. For now. I tend to focus on these social spaces, which is maybe an easy way out. What was the connection between the coffee house and the brothel, real quickly? Sorry? I missed it. What is the connection? What was the connection between the coffee house and the brothel? Well, I skipped it right now, because, but it would have been about, it, it, about different kinds of social spaces and, 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 and the nighttime in the city, just giving examples of different social spaces. At that point, they that's... They become one, one and the other? I mean, the coffee house and brothels? No, no, no. no. Coffee house, bathhouse, uh, streets, they constitute different social spaces for different kinds of encounters and with very different kinds of uh, receptions. It was an encyclopedic list of social spaces. It didn't have a particular analytic point. So I think a possibility for getting at some of the more gendered elements that you know the sources just aren't there for is kind of discussing the significance of the creation of the social spaces and the varying forms in which these coffee houses existed. What does it mean to be a permanent structure versus a more transient structure that's moving along the street where women could have easily been walking as well? What does it mean to have a closed space versus an open space? Um, and what happens exactly and what does it say about the creation of public social space when instead of frequenting a kavehane, you frequent your own um, kave odase? What does that mean um, for both public space and for the gendered elements uh, related to coffee? Um, and I think beyond that, I think something that you said was that you were really interested in the, the vistas as they interplay with the open spaces and the windows. And I think that that's really fascinating. But what struck me more is that there seems to be a social transparency that exists with these windows. And I think the last image you showed really got at that, is that you have a collection of people that are looking in and seeing what's going on. Um, and, and that's welcomed based on the structure in which the Kavehana exists. And at the same, to the same extent, there's also a social monitoring that could potentially occur. And who's doing that monitoring? And is there any power that exists within that? So I'm just wondering if maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> no, that was very good. Thank you. It's the kind of thing that I have to continue to think about and develop a better understanding of. Now, there is somebody visiting at Harvard this year from Holland for the two years last year and this year, and he's working on windows in early modern Europe. It's a great topic. It's a fascinating topic. Um, I've given him some things from the Fetva collections where this matter appears a lot because obviously it has to do with uh, urban construction. And when your neighbor built something higher 
that can look into your own spaces, that's something you can go to court for. Um, and in that respect, the households, in principle, were spaces that shouldn't be readily seen by any of the neighbors. Um, that's clear enough. Yeah. Can be can be different. You're right, but you know, it's not very easy to have space windows in which you can look out to social spaces without being seen at all. It is possible; it happens, but it's it's not so easy. Mm-hmm. That's right. Sitting at the street. No, this one? The table's outside. Yeah. The street. Right, so, and then this also comes. This one? Yeah. yeah, this one too. Well, this is, even, this, is, this is even more out in the street. So, then it becomes very much so to your question about urban spaces. Mm -hmm. um, Right. In terms of other modernizing transformations and different sensibilities that are being Yes, 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 quite right. I mean, this one could be very intimidating for people walking by. <laughs> Go back to your question. Definitely. Yes. Uh, what can I say? <laughs> That was also pro problematic. Mm -hmm. okay. Potentially, yes. If I may, I could just refer you back to that slide uh, of, of the Aleppo Kafehana, and you can see on, on the elevation there are windows that would sit along the street uh, that you had. And that was an innovation, I mean, to have the fenestration right along the street. Yes. Uh, actually, yes. So you can see there, right. Right, thank you. Yes. No, so much here. <laughs> In terms of the history of the streets, which is also barely beginning, so much. I mean, Kuluchali Pasha Jami, circa 1580, is the first when you have, and that's near that's very close to this coffee shop, to this one down the hill from this one, close to this one, yeah, around here. Uh, it, it is the first mosque for monumental intervention in the city at the same time, not just a mosque, but think of it as a monumental intervention in the city when the building has seats, open air seats all around it. 
mastaba, as it is called. You know, stone, you can sit, you could converse. People did, in fact, people do still. So there is a development in the same period toward a new interaction with the street, and not just in the coffee houses. I know I didn't answer your question. I really don't know how much more to say, though it's obviously something that it's worth for me to continue to reflect on. I have done some of it, but it's, uh, it's a difficult thing, given that you have to juggle so many ends of it. Um, it is clearly a power relation. I mean, in these stories of Atai, in, if we could do more with the texts, if we had time to read some of it, there are some. <laughs> there are stories of voyeurism, which in one of Hamse, one of Atai's uh, quintet, the Hamse, uh, there is a story of a man, a scholar, who later becomes, uh, you know, humiliated by the young girls who find a way of mocking him. Uh, there is a scholar in Üsküdar, on the hills of Üsküdar, in Balarbashi, <laughs> uh, who keeps watching the girls in the playing in the garden of his neighbor. And then they play a trick. It's a, it's, it's a very intricate, very interesting story. They play a trick and, and call all of the neighbors suddenly to descend on him and catch him, flagrante. Uh, you know, in, in, the, in a very scandalous position. And, and see, I've been thinking of that. <laughs> <laughs> How do they find a way of strategizing this? Where, at what point do they see the, the, the voyeur, the, the, the one who is watching them? And um, yeah, <laughs> much more to do, much more, which is fun. So we are actually um, out of time. I'm 